I want to sing it tonight together. It's a song that came out in 2004. It was based on Psalm 32. Let's sing it together tonight. Great song. Let's take a few moments and greet those folks around you.
Good evening, everyone. You may be seated. I want to remind you of our opportunity to give. Just encourage you to do that. Support uh, the ministry here at Hope. And uh, God blesses cheerful giver, doesn't he? Amen. Well, it's good to see all of you tonight. Uh, Did we get our Bible studies passed out? Okay, everybody got one? Anybody need one? Okay. Just keep your hands raised. Our uh, farmer will get these to you. I said, man, we, I said, what's up, man? He said, his heater don't work in his car. I said, oh, okay. He's like me. He's cheap. So he, he's got a 2.0 liter engine in that car. So that's why I said, save money on gas. So that's my kind of guy right there. If I had a choice, I was looking at, talking to one of my coworkers, he was asking me yesterday what kind of car he should buy. He's a young man, 19 years old. And so we were, he mentioned a car, so I looked it up on my phone. I was like, well, I was telling him pros and cons of different things. But I said, the main thing you need to keep in mind is your gas. I said, uh, it's going to be a constant expense for you. And the car he was looking at, there's a, a four-cylinder, which is a 2.0, and then there was one that was a six-cylinder, a 3.3. I said, go with the 2.0, the four-cylinder. So anyway... I'm with you, brother. All right, when you get that, uh, it's actually, there's, there's print on both sides, so you may just choose some, uh, a blank area there to write down your prayer needs. But I'm gonna give you three, and then if you have any, uh, you can give them to me from your seat there, and I'll mention them on the microphone so those that'll watch online later. We're not able to do our live stream tonight uh, because of uh, our wonderful internet service that we don't get that we pay for once again. So uh, Brother Sean's going to work real hard. Can we give Brother Sean a hand? What an amazing servant he is. Does a great job. Um, he, uh, he's going to be real fast as soon as our service is over to make sure that those that want to watch it, like Andrew and Jenna and others that have been texting me, say, hey, how come the service is not live? And so Brother Mike, I told Andrew, I said, tell Jenna I said hi, and I'm still wondering why she did it. So I was doing that while y'all were singing. <laughs> but anyway, I want you to write down uh, Jonah. This is the third time he's been sick. He, he gets sick, gets better for a few days, and he's sick again. Been to the doctor twice this week, and uh, so I'm really concerned about him. So be praying for Jonah if you would. And then Carrie Case has been sick. Uh, COVID's went through their house, Brad, Carrie, and the family. And so uh, we hadn't seen them in like three or four weeks. So we, we're praying for you guys. I know you are watching tonight. And so write her name down if you would, Carrie Case. And then... Um, I want to continue praying for my friend A.J. and his wife, Jenny, if you'll write their names down. A.J. and Jenny in Arkansas. Praying for good reports on, on their cancer. Both of them in their 30s and have a different type of cancer, but we're believing God's healing hand and touch in their life. And so just keep praying, praying for those. And I'm getting some text right now as I'm preaching. Uh, Zoe, pray for Zoe Rogers. She's sick. So if you would, write her name down. If we were doing our live stream, I'd just tell people to text me here and we can announce them. That'd be a good way to do our online. So it'd be live. We're not able to do that tonight. So anyway, anybody else have a need you want to mention? And we'll call it over the microphone so those watching online can write them down and pray as well. Yes, ma'am. So Andy and Jennifer, okay, we've got COVID and a lot of things going on with their family, so pray for Andy and Jennifer. All right, any other needs y'all want to mention? Oh, I'm sorry, go right ahead. Steve, Steve and Chad Fancher. Pete, as you call him. 
Steve and Chad. We're praying for those gentlemen. All right, anyone else have one you want to mention? Brother Shane's got an unspoken tonight. All right. What else? How many of you got somebody that, uh, and young people too, I mean, uh, raise your hand if this is true for you. Hopefully you got a pen, you can write, write their name down. But I want to just challenge each of you to think about those in your life right now. There's a young man that I'm thinking about. I'm going to write his name down. I've been talking to him just about every day, and he's asking a bunch of questions. He's actually younger than, than Patrick. So he's younger than my oldest son, but just really been able to uh, speak into his life lately, and he's been coming to me. And um, his name is uh, Alex. And so I'm going to be praying for Alex, but is there someone that you know that needs the Lord? How many of you got somebody that you know that needs the Lord, needs Jesus in their life that currently don't have him? Yeah. And so I just want to challenge you to write their name down. And when we pray, spend, spend just a segment of our prayer. We'll do that tonight, just praying for that person or that family. How many of you know more than one? Let me see your hands. That's all of us. So I just want to challenge you. Pray for them. Pray for them tonight. Pray for them when you go home. This week, be praying for them. Don't ever give up praying for those folks. And as I pray for my friend, you pray for your friend. And uh, one of the phrases that you'll hear us talk about Sunday is God still, in, it's actually in tonight's message. You'll, see, you'll hear it twice, you hear it tonight and Wednesday. Uh, tonight and Wednesday, tonight is Wednesday. Tonight and Sunday morning. But prayer does make a difference. And that's certainly a prayer that God uh, wants to answer is, is seeing lost people saved. He loves hearing us call their names out because that shows that we're taking time, we're concerned, we're burdened. Are you still burdened for those folks? I asked you to raise your hand a moment ago. Are you still burdened for them? Will you pray for them tonight? Let's do that beyond tonight. Any, any other needs? Okay. Uh, what's his last name? Pray for Phil Stevens. This is a brother Kyle's family member. Just got a, a really bad medical report, so pray for Phil. Somebody I actually know, tell him we're, we're praying for him. And, uh, all right. Derek, is that your phone going off? Yes. Let's pray for the Burke family. Kids, grandkids. Fish, as you get older, as they start to scatter, get older and go to college and have families of their own in different places. Go ahead, Ethan. Oh, Zach. Zach Fancher, your brother. Awesome. Good to see Vincey and Zach the last several Sundays. Good to have him back with us. Anyone else? All right, well, let's pray together and ask God to bless these needs. If you heard a name around you, try to call that out. I encourage you to take this list as we do every Wednesday and use it as your prayer, personal prayer list. And, and uh, as we pray, I want you to think about that person. Well, in fact, that's what we'll begin praying for. Who will begin praying for? Is that family or that person that, that you raised your hand a moment ago and said, hey, they need Jesus. So let's, let's begin praying now for that uh, person or family or individual. Lord, you know those, these needs, these names that are on our hearts. And I just want to challenge everyone through this prayer to continue to pray. As I lift my friend Alex up, she would just continue to deal with his heart. I can see that I can see the stones being unturned and the answers to the questions that he's been asking. And I'm I'm trusting one day he's gonna come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I pray that for each person and family that we're praying for right now. We're praying, God, and we're believing. He continue to speak. 
to their hearts and into their lives. I want to ask everybody to pray for Jonah right now. Pray for Carrie Case, AJ and Jenny, Zoe Rogers, a lot of sickness, Andy and Jennifer, Phil Stevens, recent report, pray that his trust will be in you. And we certainly want to lift up all the spiritual needs, Steve and Chad and our family members that need you. I mentioned earlier from one of our sisters. So the nephew mentioned Zach. We pray for Zach Fancher. And uh, we pray for the unspokens tonight. The one that was spoken and then many that are on our hearts this evening. We ask you to bless this Bible study and all those that are here tonight, those that are watching online, those that will watch later. Uh, we just ask that you would speak to our hearts for we need a word from you right here in the middle of the week. And we're excited about our selected psalm study and our psalm we're doing tonight out of Psalm 32. Thank you, Lord, for being such a good, good father to each of us. And we worship you and praise you tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Psalm 32, if you'll turn with me there. Psalm 32. Brother Sean, I, hopefully you have the wherewithal. You can follow us along on those 11 verses. They're, they won't be on the screen. Uh, but hopefully you can put those up as we go along. And uh, for those that are watching, then we're going to jump right into our message tonight. Well, I try to go through... Uh, in order, we, we did Psalm 115 last week. There's probably three or four more Psalm messages. And so we'll be finishing up probably somewhere at the end of February, just to let you know. Uh, then we're going to have a young man bring the word one Wednesday night after that. And then we're probably going to go, we're prayerfully seeking to go into some type of men and women's and young people's studies. Uh, thinking, just trying to think outside the box and do some different things. And so uh, anyway, we'll be giving you some information on that real soon. And we're excited uh, about, about all the things God wants to do this year and uh, excited that you're here to be a part of it. And so let's look at Psalm 32. And then next week, it'll be probably Psalm 100 and something or another. But Psalm 32 says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, David said, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sat as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. You did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Verse 6, therefore, let all the faithful pray to you, while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. Will you all say that with me? Ready? You are my hiding place. One more time. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Man, I love that song we sang tonight. Beautiful song. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. He gives us a warning here. He says, don't be like the horse or the mule, which they, they have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous, seeing all you who are upright in heart. If someone were to ask you, to describe forgiveness, how would you do it? How would you describe it? Where would you begin? How long would it take? And I, I thought about that question this week and probably talk about it for a long time. And maybe it's my age, maybe it's the things that I've been through. A lot of it may have to do with being a pastor. Uh, boy, I tell you, there's a lot that I could say about forgiveness tonight. And a lot of it would, 
you know, probably be principles based on the Bible. Some would be just my personal experience. So what, what would you say? How, how would, if somebody asked you to describe forgiveness, how would you do it? The writer of Psalm 32 answered like this. He said, forgiveness? Forgiveness is something to shout about. That's what he's saying here. The manufacturers of Tide Detergent once had a website for stain removal called the Stain Detective. And users could identify the type of stain that they're trying to remove. They could submit a request for advice and then receive information regarding the best way to get the stain out of the fabric. Of course, most of the solutions involved the use of a Tide product. It was a Tide commercial. But in Psalm 32, David is our spiritual, David is our spiritual stain detective as he counsels us, and write this in, how to remove the stain of sin from our lives. David's our spiritual stain detective as he counsels us how to remove the stain of sin in our lives. I'm not going to ask you how many sins you think you've committed in your life. But I'll tell you, we all share something in common tonight. We're all sinners. And we've all sinned a lot. In fact, I would say this week we've probably committed a bunch of sins. But I'm thankful tonight. And, and I love what David said here in Psalm 32. His, his answer to how he describes forgiveness is forgiveness. Forgiveness is something to shout about. Because we've sinned a lot. But I'm thankful in Romans still says where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. But to be forgiven, a lot of folks don't put this together, and you don't hear it from a lot of pulpits, but to be forgiven, you've got to confess your sin. And John said if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to do what? Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, but we must confess. And he says, when you confess, he'll forgive. So David's our, our spiritual stain detective as he counsels us how to remove the stain of sin in our lives. Let me ask you a question. Once you got saved, did you sin after you got saved? How'd you feel that first sin after you got saved? What'd you th what do you think? What did you think? Yeah, like a failed God. And guess what? We did fail him. And we, we failed him over and over and over. But I'm so thankful tonight. And we're going to be reminded tonight as we look at what David said. Many, many times we failed when we confess our sins. The Bible says that God will be faithful to forgive us of our failures. We confess our sins. Can you say Amen. No matter what sin has marred your life, David directs us to the same solution. Write this in. What do y'all think the next blank is? Blank is found in God alone. What do y'all think it is? There you go. Forgiveness. Brother Mark, I'm so sorry. The Cowboys just can't make it past the first round. Barely get to the first round. They just can't make it. But one thing I am for sure about tonight is they didn't make it and forgiveness Two things is found in God alone. David is excited about forgiveness, and he wants everybody to shout about it. How many of you have failed since you've been saved? Let me see your hands. All right. How many of you have been forgiven since you've been saved? When you confessed, you were forgiven. Raise your hands. How many of you are thankful for that tonight? How many of you don't want to keep raising your hand up and down at church tonight? Why? We need the exercise. We got these new stairs in our house. And I go all the way down, come all the way back up. And I'm like, forget my keys. I got to go. I told Olivia yesterday, I was like, <sighs> I'm glad we got these stairs. These are probably good for us. <sighs> She's like, not me. Her knee, but it's probably good re rehabilitation. Let's look at four or five things tonight. As I outlined, the more time I have in preparing a message, the outline gets longer. But we've got to deal with all 11 verses. And our verse 11 will be in our conclusion. So the first 10 verses we'll deal with and the meanings of it in our message tonight. The first thing I want to talk about is the person of forgiveness. The person of forgiveness. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Blessed is he or she whose transgressions are forgiven, 
whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him and whose spirit is no deceit. Forgiveness is a state of being that's exciting. That's what David's saying here. If you're a person who's been forgiven, you got something to be excited about. I mean, look at all the things he says in those verses. And by the way, what does the word blessed mean here? It means happy or fulfilled or joyful. Is he or she whose transgressions or sins or iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered? It means like a garment. We'll talk about that in a few moments. Blessed is he or she whose sin the Lord does not count against him and whose spirit is no deceit. Forgiveness is a state of being that is exciting. I mean, it feels good. Look at the meaning of the words used to describe what God does when he forgives a person. Letter A, you're forgiven. That means that, that God lifts up the burden of guilt in your life and he carries it away. Somebody said one day they were saved later in life. It was a man and he was like you and me. He was a sinner and he'd sinned a bunch. So God forgave him a bunch, forgave him for it all. And he said the moment he came to Jesus, and he was, I don't know how old he was, but I think he was near 60 years old. And he gave his life to Jesus for the first time, and he said, it, it's his testimony. He said, it felt like the moment that I asked Jesus into my life, and he forgave me of my sins. He said, it felt like that I laid down a bag of heavy stones that I'd been carrying all my life. The Bible says that he forgives us. Blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven. It means that he lifts up the burden of guilt and he carries it away. By the way, I asked you a while ago, how did it feel when you first sinned after you got saved? And you said what? Like you failed God? Listen to me. Guilt is a good thing to have in your life. You know why? That's the Holy Spirit's conviction. We're going to do another study on the Holy Spirit probably later in the year. And that's one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is he convicts you. You know, when you are in a very dangerous place is when you can sin, you just don't feel any conviction, like there's no conscience there. But I'm thankful tonight that we have the Holy Spirit of God to convict us. Guess what? When we confess our sin, we are, everybody say forgiven. That means he lifts up the burden of guilt and he carries it away. Letter B means that he's, he covers our sin or they're covered. He covers the sin from view. He applies the blood of his son, Jesus. When we confess our sins, the Bible says that he doesn't see our sin anymore. He sees the Savior. He sees his son, Jesus. Look at the meaning of the words used to describe what God does when he forgives a person. We're forgiven. We're covered. Letter C, he does not count it against us anymore. God, this is... This is, we talk about how amazing God is, and we could just go on and on tonight. Every one of us could testify of God's faithfulness and his goodness. Can you say amen? We go on and on. But this is one of the greatest truths about your God and my God, is God, listen to this, God chooses not to think of the forgiven person as guilty anymore. He chooses to. When it says that he cast our sin into the sea of forgetfulness not to be remembered against us anymore, that doesn't mean that God actually can't remember it because God can do all things, right? He can lift a rock so heavy that he can't make a rock so heavy that he can't lift it. You know, but one of those conundrums. But listen, this is how amazing our God is. He chooses not to remember it anymore. He chooses not to think of the forgiven person as guilty anymore. You know what we as human beings do? There could, there could be somebody that could be the most amazing person God ever created. They do all these great things, for, even for God. And they make one mistake. Media is all over it. Basically, it's something about the church or a pastor or, you know, some spiritual leader because Satan's out to attack. And we remember that, that one stain, don't we? Well, yeah, they, he, you know, I about called a name out. I'm glad I didn't name names. But yeah, he or she, 
But they, and well, that one thing. Aren't you glad God's not like us? Aren't you glad God's not like us? Aren't you glad God's not like us? It, it, we're forgiven, we're covered. It does not count against us. God chooses not to think of the forgiven person as guilty anymore. So that's the person of forgiveness. Number two, let's look at the pain of forgiveness. The pain of forgiveness. Verses three and four says, when I kept silent, this is David talking, he said, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, look at here, day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. And then we come to the word what? Selah. Selah. You pronounce it both ways. What does that mean? What, is, what does that word mean? You remember? Yeah, pause, meditate, ponder, think about what was just said. Notice first what is not mentioned here. The actual, David didn't mention his sin. In this passage, David fails to tell us what his sin was. He doesn't even give us a hint. Why? Because what he did is not the issue. The focus is on God's forgiveness. This, boy, I love this statement. The seriousness of the sin doesn't affect the capacity of God to forgive. That's a good statement. In other words, what you and I do, the, and we categorize sin, God really does not do that. Sin's just missing the mark. God doesn't look at all these different things. Now, there are one or two things in the Bible that he mentions that go against his direct creation that he calls an abomination. And that's another series of messages. But the seriousness of our sin doesn't affect the capacity of God to forgive. In other words, I do something really bad and you commit this little small sin as we think, and we categorize God, when we confess, both of us, God forgives us the same. After David sinned, David says, I kept silent. And that's when his trouble began. See, you and I try to manage guilt, or we try to cope with guilt, or we try to rationalize guilt away. We even try to blame someone else. Why? Because that minimizes our guilt. It gets the focus off of us. Observe what happens here. Letter A, write this down. David says he had physical deterioration. Physical deterioration. He writes, my bones wasted away. No one questions the delicate balance between mind and body anymore. Guilt ravages a person physically. David said, man, this is really hurting me physically. Hope you all are listening. Letter B, mental suffering. David describes a relentless anguish in his soul. And it doesn't stop, he said. It's, it's all day and night. Physical deterioration, mental suffering. And then he says spiritual separation. This is the most serious thing about our sin, is spiritual separation. David feels distance between God and himself. It appeared that God was hostile towards him. Guilt, I said it appeared. I didn't say God was hostile, I said it appeared. And the reason is because guilt warps our perception of who God is. We, we don't remember that, oh, wait a minute, God is ready to forgive me when I confess. So he had physical deterioration, he had mental suffering, he had spiritual separation. Ultimately, here's the deal. All of enjoyment in life is lost. The Bible says in verse 4 that our strength and our desire for life is transformed into this arid, dry landscape. So we see the, the person of forgiveness. We see the pain of forgiveness. We're trying to, we're in the middle of our sin, and before we get to that place of confessing, we see all these things that David said that he experienced. But ultimately, all in, enjoyment of life is lost. That's why, listen, that's why uh, it was a book he wrote many years ago, um, Adrian Rogers, and it was called What Every Christian Ought to Know. And here's what he said, one statement in that book that I still remember. He said, the, we, we think as Christians the most miserable person in the world is a lost person. He said, that's not true. He said the most miserable person in the world is a saved person who has unconfessed sin in his or her life. 
That's what David's saying here in Psalm 32. He said, man, it messes with you physically, mentally, most of all spiritually. Ultimately, all enjoyment of life is lost. So I want to encourage you to daily confess. Encourage me to daily confess our strength and our desire for life can be transformed. And we see that here with David. Number three, we see the picture of forgiveness. Verse five, look what he says. He said, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And he said, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Then what does he say? There's the word again, Selah. Think about it. Go back, ponder, and meditate, and think about what you just read. David describes how to thoroughly deal with guilt and obtain forgiveness from God. Please don't miss these A, B, and C. Write these down. I hope you young people write these down too. I don't see everybody writing, but I hope, hope, you, hope you can get these. Letter A, sin must be acknowledged. Sin must be acknowledged. David writes, I acknowledged my sin to you. He simply and clearly stated that what he did was a sin. This can be particularly challenging if we believe other people are to blame. You and I are never going to be able to change what we don't acknowledge. You and I have got to understand and acknowledge our sin. David said, I acknowledge my sin to you, God. He simply and clearly stated, he said, God, what I did was wrong. It was a sin. Sin must be acknowledged. Secondly, letter B, sin must be exposed. David adds that he did not cover up his sin. Literally, he is saying, I have made my sin naked and bare before you, God. I'm not covering up. I'm not hiding anything. And by the way, we can't hide anything from God anyway. We can hide stuff from each other. But God knows our heart. We see what each other is doing, but God not only sees what we're doing, he sees why we're doing it. Sin must be acknowledged. It must be exposed. The word cover here, I talked about this early, but the word cover it refers to the normal function of a garment in its natural sense. When we cover, or excuse me, when we confess our sin, we strip away all the ridiculous attitudes that we use to dress up what we've done. This is an experience of shame. It doesn't feel good, but it will not last for long. Remember that whatever we expose and we uncover through confession, God will soon cover and hide from view through his forgiveness. Maybe there's something tonight that you need to acknowledge before God. I didn't say come up here and acknowledge it. I think sometimes, you know, a public confession is, is needed and, and it's helpful, but not always. But private confession is always needed. Would you agree? For all of us, there was a young man after a youth rally one time, he came up here and he admitted a sin in front of the whole youth group. Young ladies, men, other adults that were here, they got back to his parents that he did that. They left the church, never came back. The father couldn't handle other folks knowing about what his son did. And I... I, I tried whenever it was over. I called him into my office and I said, son, I, I appreciate and I, I, I admire your honesty. But let me try to also give you a little bit of admonishment here, a little bit of uh, advice that there's some things that we shouldn't publicly <laughs> say because you know what? I said, especially those young, they're never going to forget what you said. So we need to make sure that we all go in our prayer closet and acknowledge our sin before God. We're all on the same page with that tonight, right? Some things we don't need to publicly say, but boy, we need to acknowledge all of our sin before God. And that's what David said. I'm acknowledging all my sin. I'm exposing it. I'm uncovering it before your eyes, God. What does the scripture say? There's a sign. I was going down the highway the other day and it was a sign up on the highway. I think it was on 75. It said that if you cover your sin, God will uncover it. If you uncover it before God, God will cover it. 
That's what David's saying here. Must be acknowledged, must be exposed. Letter C, sin must be confessed. The word confess means to cast or throw something away. Confession is the act of fully casting away our sin, guilt, and shame before God. Do you see the entire picture that David's painted for us? We're talking about the painting. Thirdly, the painting of forgiveness. We call what we did sin as God does. We take full responsibility for the sin. We make no attempts to dress it up or hide our sin. Rather, we expose it before God. Then we take that sin and we cast it away from us before God. We don't just confess it, but we cast it away. And when we do that, we confidently join in David's joy when he writes, God forgave the guilt of my sin. Because I confessed it, but I also cast it away. And God has forgiven me. How many of you would say, with your personal experience in your Christian life, that it's made the world a difference, giving you peace in your heart? When you've confessed, God's forgiven, and then he's brought peace into your heart. You've experienced those stages. Number four, let's look at the protection of forgiveness. Letter A, there are some effects of this protection, and I'm giving you really a sub-point of a sub-point here. Number one, prayer. Look at verse six. The Bible says, for this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Let me ask you, how often do you pray? How would you describe your prayer life right now? I was meeting with a family recently, and I really appreciated their honesty because we talked about personal relationship with God. And I just asked him, I said, well, how, you know, the most important thing is your relationship with God right now. How, how would you rate it? And I said, I don't need to say it out loud, but the man led and then others followed behind. And they were completely honest. Uh, how would, just being honest tonight between you and God, how often tonight would you, how, how often have you prayed in, let's say, the last, this year? I mean, we're, we're still in January. How would you describe your prayer life right now? And let me ask you, how important do you think prayer should be in your life? David said, surely the rising, look at the next part of verse 6. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach you. So we see the effects of this protection is number one, prayer, but number two, prevention. Prayer, again, what I mentioned earlier when we were talking earlier, prayer does make a difference. We could probably all give, illustra- uh, give a testimony tonight as I talked about God's goodness while I go. We could talk about God answering prayer, couldn't we? How many of you remember when God answered a prayer for you? Let me see your hands. How many of you, let's just be honest, how many of you would say tonight, let's all wake up and look this way. How many of you would say, I remember when God answered a prayer of mine? Let me see your hands. I prayed a specific prayer a few days ago. It was just me and God. I said, God, you know about this already. And I prayed that prayer. And guess what? Wasn't just a little bit of time. And the answer came. God answered. And I knew it. Right where I was, I could take it where I was. And tears just come out of my, come out of, I about said, tears come out of my face. Okay, I guess it was my part of my face because it was my eyes. But tears came out of my eyes. And I was just praising God. Because he does, prayer does make a difference. Prayer, this is a good statement. Prayer is connected to protection. We see that here in this, this, these verses. And then we see not only effects, but letter B, right? We see evidence of this protection. Verse 7, number 1, we see there's a hiding. Look at verse 7. Thou art my what? Hiding place. I remember as a child, we, there was a bunch of kids in my neighborhood. And there's not that many now when, uh, last time I went back there. But for some reason, whenever I was growing up, there was just a lot of kids my age. And we were just, God had just blessed us with a lot of kids. We were able to play the neighborhood a lot. And we, 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 did, we played hide and go seek, especially in the summertime. And uh, I remember playing that game, and after a few times, I found a really good place to hide. 
that nobody ever found me at. And uh, so finally when they say we give up, then you come out. And I never told anybody where that place was because I didn't want them finding me there. But I want to tell you, we have a safe place. God is our hiding place from the enemy. And I'm so thankful. Even, even uh, you know, there's sometimes we just got to go. Just us and God in his presence. And I'm so thankful for the evidence of that protection and the hiding. Number two, protecting. Look at verse, this is just right out of the verses. He says, thou shalt preserve me from trouble. And I guess in the King James, we could say there was a preserving or protecting. Let's be reminded tonight of just how vicious and determined that the devil is on destroying us. We've, we've been talking about memorizing scripture. Here's a verse to memorize. James 4, 7. Does anybody know that verse? Right offhand. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will. Let's say that together. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Let's say it again. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. How many of you know scripture makes a difference when you put it in your heart? Uh, Jonah is so hilarious. Right, well, not right now because he's sick. But, uh, but he... This new house with him, he's scared to death to go anywhere. Y'all have heard me talk about that. And so I share with him Psalm 91, 4, where it says, I'm covered with feathers. And so the other night, he was just in the next room. I was like, son, it's right there. There's three, 32 lights on. I mean, I'm dad's right here. And there's nobody else up here. I mean, it's just us. Said, well, I'm still scared. I said, remember Psalm 91, 4? He said, Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm covered with feathers. And then he walked in there and came right back. But it does make a difference. James 4, 7, let's say it again together. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. One more time. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There's a, the effects are prayer and prevention, but the evidence is hiding, protecting. And then we see surrounding. Look at verse 7. Thou shalt come pass me about, or thou shalt surround me. That we sang tonight about the songs of deliverance. I love this word or this phrase, songs of deliverance. Deliverance is one of the giant words in Scripture. It is a broadly inclusive term which describes forgiveness of sin. Think, look, listen to these. Forgiveness of sin, redemption from eternal death, recovery of physical illness, release from spiritual bondage, and rescue from difficult situations. Everybody say deliverance. As our Savior, Jesus has become our deliverer. The essence of the meaning of salvation is deliverance. So when we read songs of deliverance, we may well tune our souls to the promise and potential of such power being put on human lips. Think about what the Scripture says. The Scripture says that David sang and Saul was relieved of demonic oppression. The Bible says that Jehoshaphat's choir sang and their enemies were conquered. Then you go to the New Testament, it says that Paul and Silas sang and an earthquake shook their chains free and a Roman guard along with his whole household were brought into God's kingdom. Songs of deliverance are real instruments of divine grace. Again, songs of deliverance. Let's look at number five, the products of forgiveness. The Bible says in verse 8, letter A, he says he gives us instruction. Look at verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that you should go. So we see instruction in that verse. I will guide you with my eye. We see counsel, letter B. And then we see, letter C, surrounded by the unfailing love of God. Look at verse 10. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him or surround him about. So the products of forgiveness, as we go through this whole process of asking God to forgive us, these are the things that happen. And he says, you know what? Not only am I going to protect you, but I'm going to instruct you. I'm going to counsel you. I'm going to surround you with my unfailing love. With God, or I would say if I'm alliterating, with the Lord, you aren't going to lose. It's impossible. Your faith is in God. You confess your sins 
God will forgive. That's the message, Brother Al, Psalm 32. It's a psalm that you and I talked about last week. You sent me a text about it. Psalm 32 is all about David saying, hey, this psalm, I mean, we're going to, we're going to describe what forgiveness is. He said forgiveness is something to shout about. Look at the last verse in conclusion. Verse 11. The Bible says, Be glad in the Lord or rejoice in the Lord, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Sing is what that means. In the final verse of Psalm 32, David makes it clear that rejoicing is a non-optional activity for those who really know the forgiveness of God. They've got something to shout about. Let me ask you. Do you have something to shout about tonight? I would say if you've experienced God's forgiveness, you've got a lot to shout about. Say, well, you don't know what's going on in my life right now. No, I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time. Well, happens, don't it? It's, it's tough. Now, in my adult life, I haven't went without Jesus because I got saved when I was 17. I'm going to tell you, I can't because of how good God is and how he's met every single need that I've ever had. I've had a lot of trouble in my life. Uh, and, and, and it's not perfect right now, just to be quite honest. In fact, there's a lot of things that's just downright depressing and discouraging. And Can anybody relate? I, I, I have no idea what people do whose trust is not in the Lord. So I can, man, when I read Psalms like 32, like chapter 32, it reminds me, oh yeah. I got a lot to be thankful for tonight. I got a lot to shout about. Yeah, there are all these things, but my focus is not on those things. My focus is on the Lord tonight. How many of you would say, He's provided before. He's been faithful before. He's going to come through again. I mean, he would just step forward and say, I believe that tonight. I'm, I'm, st I'm standing in faith with you, Brother Ben. I really hope that you won't miss Sunday's message. We're going to finish our series, Limitless Life. We're going to talk about the, having the constant awareness of God, and there'll be some of this that'll trickle over into that message. I want to close tonight. Kyle, I'm glad you're over there because this is the whole reason why I had you there for these pictures. Are you ready? This guy, Mr. Ahola, is regarded as one of the strongest men in the world. In fact, he holds the world record for lifting the heaviest Atlas stone sphere over three and a half feet onto a barrel. The stone weighed 474 pounds. How many of you would say if that was you it would be double hernia surgery <laughs> that's all I could think about when I read that in addition he once carried a small car over 90 feet the car weighed 978 pounds it was your car Kyle with you in it his feats of strength pale in comparison with the weight that you and I carry when we do not confess our sin God alone can lift it off of us and carry it away through his son's death on the cross listen we must confess here's something else i don't know if you ever heard of this geocaching how many of you heard of that before i read today there are 791 of these in owasso just in owasso alone i don't know about tulsa i'm sure it's more but geocaching is a hobby in America involving the use of a handheld GPS. Someone hides something of value somewhere in the United States and they post the latitude and longitude coordinates on a website and they wait for the item to be found. Users of the website look for the hidden material called a cache. Upon discovering of the hiding place, geocache enthusiasts replace the item with something else so they take what they want to take out of it and then they replace it with something else and then they post the changes on the website for future uh, 
adventurers, I guess. <laughs> the goal is to make the search as challenging as possible. How many of you ever done that? Maybe I should have started out with that. Okay, none of us. How many of you are going to do it this week? Oh, you have done it? How was it? Did you find it? How'd it go? Nine items? That's awesome. You just stole nine items from the box? You didn't replace it with anything? <laughs> How about you? It's fine. Fine. Okay. Well, maybe uh, Alex and um, James can be our, our tour guides for hope caching. We'll just call it next time we decide to go. However, the Lord, listen, final statement, the Lord covers our sins so completely that they never can be found. How many of you would like to come up here on stage tonight and share the deepest, darkest sin that you've ever committed? Raise your hand. I don't see any hand. I better put my hand down. I don't see anybody. None of us want that. Aren't you thankful tonight that God covers our sin so completely that they never can be found? How many of you would say you're thankful for that tonight? We can't leave to everybody's hands raised. You have to be thankful. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Psalm 32. My goodness, what a, what a message. We're so encouraged tonight that there's no sin that we can commit that Lord, you won't forgive. I understand what the, the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is, and well, that's that's another topic the point is our sins can be forgiven when we confess I'm so thankful tonight for the conviction of the Holy Spirit when that conviction comes that we confess and when we confess you forgive that is something to shout about somebody asks us what forgiveness is we can hopefully remember what David taught us here in Psalm 32 and we can just say you know what forgiveness is something to shout about forgiveness is something in verse 11 that we can be rejoicing about because yeah I've sinned greatly but God has forgiven me greatly praise your name for forgiveness tonight thank you God that we can stand in forgiveness this evening and even tomorrow and Friday and the rest of this week we confess our sins you'll be faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness thank you for the reminder that we can be forgiven tonight that's something to shout about that's something to get excited about thank you for being so good to us help us to be faithful to you this week help us be faithful to share maybe even with this person or family that we prayed for earlier. Thank you for every young person, every adult that's listening to this message tonight. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. Would you stand with me tonight as we dismiss? Thank you for being here. And for Sean, we'll be excited about that link as soon as you get it done. So thank you for everything that you do. Uh, Again, thank you for being here this evening, and I hope that uh, you have a great rest of the week. And just before you leave, if you have not filled out one of these, there are still some over on the foyer, and we want to make sure we get one of these from each of you. And so uh, fill it out with your information so we can uh, update our files and um, help us to minister to you throughout the year more effectively. And I hope to see all of you back this Sunday as we finish up our series on limitless life our title this week unless uh, it's changed is um, it's a really good title I don't even remember it it's a great title that's how that's how good it is y'all gonna be blown away with this title it's limitless something or another it begins with an a <laughs> so <laughs> awareness 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 the power of God's presence in your life so Real excited about that all right well why don't you stick around the fellowship for a little while and uh god bless you we'll see you sunday if we don't see you before song 32 32 5 5 i
acknowledge my sin to you And I did not cover my iniquity I acknowledge my sin to you And I did not cover my iniquity Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, 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 oh. I, I will confess my transgression I sent to you and I did